Thank you, Erica. Um, let's start out by saying I'm a traveler. I'm, I'm neither academic nor historian. Uh, I've been in this room before in those seats. Uh, after I graduated from Western, uh, on a whim, I decided I might want to become a diplomat, so I took the Foreign Service exam, and it happened to be in this room. <laughs> the fact that I've been in the lumber business for 31 years tells you how I did on the exam. <laughs> Um, so why Chernobyl? Why would I go to Chernobyl? Um, last December, I was in Europe on business. I was at the, it was at the end of the week, and uh, as I planned my trip, I thought, well, it's, it'll, I'll wake up Friday morning, I could either get on a plane and come back to Grand Rapids for the weekend, or if you draw a radius around Rome, which is where I ended up, and you look at all the cities that are within a two-hour uh, plane ride of Rome, there's some pretty great places to go. So I had it narrowed down. I was going to go either to uh, Paris and hang out in Montmartre and uh, drink some nice red wine and have some bouillabaisse. Or I was maybe going to go to Amsterdam, see the canals and all the wonderful museums. Or I could visit the site of the greatest technological disaster of the 20th century. That was an easy choice for me. So uh, I headed up to Kiev that weekend and uh, I don't know why but it's always been a dream of mine to uh, visit the Chernobyl because I've always been very curious about what that's all about. So um, if, if, you, um, if you remember Chernobyl like I do, uh, it was a terrible disaster. The human toll was unbelievably bad. But we didn't know then what was recently revealed about the, the seriousness of what really did happen. And I'm going to reveal that to you uh, in a little bit. So where is Chernobyl? Chernobyl is a small enough town that it really doesn't even hardly make the map. That is a, a map of Ukraine and then Belarus to the north. And if you s see, if I had a laser pointer here, which I don't, directly above Kiev, you can barely read that. There's a little uh, lake there and a river. Uh, it is a little town of Pripyat. And uh, just south of Pripyat, by a little bit less than two miles, is the town of uh, Kiev, is the town of uh, Chernobyl. And that's where the uh, plant is. Um, here's a little bit bigger map. Um, as you recall, Ukraine and Belarus were both uh, satellites of the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s. Um, the plant was built in the 70s uh, in order to supply uh, electricity to Ukraine. It supplied 10% of the electricity, which is pretty impressive considering there were 40 million people in Ukraine during that time. Um, the plant used four RBMK-1000 nuclear reactors. Now, why is that important? The reason that is important is because they are universally recognized as being inherently flawed. And unfortunately, even as they were installing them, they knew that they were inherently flawed. Um, uh, the warnings had gone out before. Uh, in addition, the plant lacked basic safety regulations. Um, and it was just, you could, the handwriting was on the wall. It was going to be a dangerous place. On uh, April 26, 1986, they decided to test a self-fueling system in order to save energy. Uh, at 1.23 in the morning, they disabled the security systems, so including the automatic shutdown. After they did that, the experiment begun. And during that time, there was a number of operations in which they violated all their standard operating procedures. There was a chain reaction which caused the top of the reactor to blow up. 1,200 ton reactor blasted away. It, uh, it released graphite and uranium into the sky. Almost immediately, there was a second explosion. Uh, 3,000 feet up in the air uh, went all the nuclear material. In the next few hours, in very basic terms, just about everything they did to mitigate the disaster only increased its severity. Uh, the first responding firemen poured water on it, which did absolutely nothing at all. Uh, these men wore no protective equipment at all and were immediately exposed to lethal radiation. A senior op operator uh, died, was to die in the ruins of the first explosion. He would be the first death. That night later on, there was another death. And over the next couple months, 28 more people were going to die. The immediate fallout from the explosion what in radiation terms was about 100 times that of Nagasaki and Hiroshima combined. 
At 5 o'clock that morning, the Kremlin was notified. Incidentally, this explosion took place about 1.30 in the morning. At 5 a.m., they informed the Kremlin. They said there's been an accident and a fire, but no explosion. Everything is safe. We have everything under control. The Kremlin was kept in the dark of the very basic nature of this explosion, not only for that day and the next day, but for several weeks on. The consequences of such uh, an omission would prove to be quite uh, dramatic. For residents of the town of Pripyat, which was uh, about two kilometers away, it was a morning just like any other morning, uh, there would be no information about the accident. There were rumors that there was a fire since they could see the plant from Pripyat and there was smoke coming out of the reactor. Interestingly, the, the eyewitnesses from Pripyat uh, tell the story that the smoke was not black, the smoke was not white or gray, the smoke was blue. Um, and they also got no information from the soldiers that were running around the streets with gas masks on. Uh, what they did not want to do was instill panic on the uh, population. Pripyat was a model planned city. Uh, it was the place to live in Soviet Russia, or actually this is in Ukraine. It was the place to live in the Soviet Union because they heavily recruited all the smartest kids out of college, all the scientists, all the hardest workers to work on these nuclear power plants. There were uh, uh, five schools and 15 kindergartens because uh, there were a lot of children there. Um, they had a lot of foreign goods. Uh, the apartments were more spacious. The food was better. And overall, there was a perception of uh, prestige among the wider society in the Soviet Union um, for Pripyat. What I like about looking at um, photos of the Soviet Union and what they did was um, this is a playground in Pripyat. Um, and they are equally adept, the Soviets are, at uh, not just appropriating American and Western trademarks, uh, but making uh, even playground equipment look Stalin-esque, as you can see by that, uh, that elephant there. The readings of the radioactivity that afternoon in uh, Pripyat would be uh, 15 times higher than usual. By that night, it would, be 16, it would be 600 times. During the first day, inhabitants were to absorb over 50 times what was considered safe. The next day, a thousand buses arrive in Pripyat. Soldiers empty out of the buses, go door to door, and they say, you have two hours. Gather your important documents. Don't bring clothes. You can't bring clothes. You can't bring furniture. Um, they were told that this would be a very short visit. Maybe we'll go camping in the woods for the weekend. We'll be back very shortly. Uh, a few days turned into a few weeks, which turned into a few months, which turned into, well, the more liberal estimates are they can return to Pripyat in 3,000 years. The more conservative estimates are 20,000 years. Now there's sort of a, I've read in doing my research for this, um, there are two schools of thought on this. Some people think that they were allowed to come back in a few months, months and get a few things. Other reports say they are not. Um, I, I'm not sure who to believe. Special teams uh, came in and emptied the contents of the apartments, buried or burned everything that was in them and buried the ash. For the next several months, the only people living in Pripyat would be uh, soldiers and scientists sent there to work on the problem, uh, a problem which they underestimated greatly from the very beginning. Within a couple days, the radioactive cloud was to spread up north into um, Belarus through the Baltics and into Scandinavia. Uh, outside a Swedish nuclear power plant, um, they had some uh, unusually high readings of radioactivity, and so they decided to send a plane up and check the atmosphere, and what they found was shocking. They, they knew a major accident must have occurred somewhere, but they, they couldn't figure out where. So they called Hans Blix down in the IAEA. You may remember Hans Blix from the uh, weapons of mass destruction days, uh, and uh, uh, he was in charge of the IAEA then, and uh, he said, no, I, I have no idea where this is coming from. Um, finally, uh, some American spy planes uh, were able to detect the wreckage of the number four reactor, and then the news uh, spread fairly quickly after that. Incidentally, Mikhail Gorbachev found out from the Swedes what the problem was. He did not find out from his own people.
As of May 1st, there was a tiny blurb in Pravda, and it said uh, there was an accident at the plant. Everything's fine. Everything is safe. Um, and uh, as you recall, uh, in communist countries, May 1 is May Day, which is a really important date, and they always have a big parade. <sighs> Once again, so that they, because they didn't want to sow panic, they didn't tell uh, people not to go out and celebrate May Day. So all over Western Russia and Ukraine, people went out for their May Day parades. Uh, and in Kiev today, it's still known that particular May Day as the Parade of Death. Um, and the Ukrainian archives have been scrubbed of all evidence of that day, that May Day parade. All the photographs and all the films are missing um, from the archives. So on the third day, uh, helicopters and pilots from Moscow and Afghan front were rushed in. They dumped tons and tons of sandbags and boric acid to try to quell the flames. Uh, 600 pilots would fly hundreds of sorties, uh, and they all received uh, at least nine times a lethal dose. They sent another battalion of firefighters. Now they dumped lead uh, into the breach in an attempt to lower the temperature. What happened then was the lead combusted. It went up into the atmosphere, and uh, just adding to the contamination. Uh, so the, uh, they, they, they scrambled helicopters up to spread a substance which congealed and brought all of the lead down onto the ground. And now they had to get the bulldozers out and bury all of that. Yes, sir? Uh, you said that they poured a substance that congealed. Uh, what, was the, what was the thing? The substance was, I have no idea. No, I, I, Jamie, I have no idea what the substance was. Yeah, it's a good question, though. So after one week, uh, having gone by, the towns of Chernobyl and Pripyat have been completely evacuated, 45,000 people from Pripyat. And all villages within 20 kilometers have been evacuated, 130,000 people, most of whom were already contaminated. So at this time, uh, Europe was at the mercy of the winds. As you can see here, um, the uh, radiation spread into Western Europe, into France, into the United Kingdom. Uh, and it was now contaminating millions of acres of crops. So the news was spreading. Now, these are just a few days after the disaster, and the, the death claims are terribly exaggerated in these. Long term, they would be uh, gross underestimations of the amount of people that did actually die. Not revealed until recently was um, there was a great fear that there was a 50% chance of a second explosion occurring several days after the first one. Uh, there were 200 tons of nuclear fuel, which was still burning, and the temperature was rising. The scientists were absolutely terrified that the cement slab below uh, the reactor would collapse, which would set off the second explosion. Had it happened, uh, the force would have been 10 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, the city of Minsk, which is 150 miles north and east of Chernobyl, would have been raised. Kiev would have not done much better, and half of Europe would have been made uninhabitable. We didn't know that at the time. They, they sent 1,000 trains cars into Minsk to start an immediate evacuation of 2 million people. So what they could determine was the magma was starting to seep down. There was a crack already in the slab. Uh, below that was an aquifer, just underneath where that slide is. The aquifer supplied water to most of Ukraine and went directly to the Black Sea. So it's time to get serious. They brought in 10,000 miners to dig underneath. They wanted to dig a tunnel, tunnel in through, and get to uh, right underneath the reactor. It's 150 meters to get there. It's 120 degrees in that tunnel as they're going. There's very little oxygen, and no, they were not wearing protective equipment. It took them one month to go 150 meters. Uh, it, it's estimated today that uh, a quarter of the guys that were in there died before they reached the age of 40. On the top of the roof, sorry about the 
quality of these photos, but you can't find anything better. On the top of the roof, it's full of shards of graphite. Uh, one shard of graphite can kill a man in just a few minutes. So they had to clear these. What they did was they sent in robots. They had robots that they were developing for the space program to land on the moon, you know, take care of Mars, et cetera. Within two days, the, robot, the circuitry and the robots went kablooey. They couldn't operate in the highly radioactive atmosphere. So they sent in what they called, and I'm not kidding, bio-robots. Those are bio-robots. They hand sewed their lead suits. They made them sort of from scratch, and they kind of made their own covers for the boots, et cetera. And you can see those are handmade shovels. And their job was, and they were given 45 seconds to do this, they would run out, they would shovel, they would get a shovel load of graphite, run to the side of the roof, and pitch it over the side of the roof in 45 seconds. Now, naturally, the amount of radiation they were subjected to was very much underestimated by the people sending them out to do that. And incidentally, they had to sign non-disclosure agreements before they went out and did that job. And I've read interviews with the, the, the liquidators, the guys that did this, and they said, you know, we were in the reserves. It is our duty. We had to do it. So the entire ra reactor now, it's got to be isolated somehow. They got to build a sarcophagus. They have to build something to cover it up. They've got to build something that's going to be 550 feet long and 200 feet high. It's got to be an utterly original design, designed from scratch. It's going to be made in pieces and parts from all over the Soviet Union, some of the parts coming from thousands of miles away. They've got to truck it all in and fit it together in sort of a jigsaw uh, puzzle way. So how do you install a massive structure that no one's ever made before when humans can only safely work on it for a few minutes at a time? You have to do it very painstakingly, and it took them seven months to do it. There's a picture of it once it was done uh, there, and the before and after. So now we've gotten into the uh, part where it's 18 days past the disaster, and Mikhail Gorbachev finally addresses the Soviet people, the first time they had talked about it in their country. So what does the immediate disaster look like in the surrounding area? This is not a postcard from Vermont in October. This is what's called the Red Forest, and an immediate area around all of deciduous trees went bright, bright red from the radiation. I'm not going to show you a lot of these, but you've probably heard about what's happened, uh, what happened to the wildlife, the offspring of the wildlife as you go through. You can find many pictures of what happened to the humans there. You can find pictures of the birth, def der birth defects. What happened to the next generation? Decorum prevents me from presenting those pictures to you today, though. If you want to look them up, you can, but I, I really wouldn't recommend it. In the first year, uh, 100,000 reservists are called in. They pass through Chernobyl in one way or another. Uh, they called them liquidators. Their job, basically, was a gigantic cleanup project. Another 400,000 civilians are brought in and hired to work on the disaster 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The liquidators are there to knock down houses, knock down buildings, take out the contents, burn, bury. There's a, over, uh, over a million cubic meters of earth was picked up, put into larger holes, and covered with cement. The radiation victims themselves, the ones at least that were symptomatic, they were all sent to hos uh, Moscow Hospital Number 6. This is a picture from there where they have the I don't know how much good that plastic around he, uh, that guy is doing, but it specializes in radiation exposure. I could also describe what happens after they're uh, uh, exposed to the doses they were, but you'd probably want to look that up yourself. So what does it look like today? This is the entrance uh, to the exclusion zone. It's a 30-kilometer circle, not really a circle, but sort of rectangle around uh, the plant itself uh, is a highly secure area. I went with five other people. You have to, uh, you have to do a whole special visa requirement before you go, uh, send them your passport, uh, get a bunch of things stamped, and when you show up, they, everything's got to be right. It's a pretty secure area. This is a typical road leading through one of the towns. 
typical house in one of the towns. It is really, nature really has taken over. Um, <clears throat> this is a, the inside of a typical house, one that hasn't been completely emptied. Um, you'll see that it's been kind of torn up. One of the big problems that they had was looters. When the, when the reservists went in, one of the reasons they called it War of Chernobyl was that they were warring, they were at war with the reactor, but they were also at war with looters, people who thought that they could go in and just take TVs and stereos and whatever they wanted. Um, I don't know if they knew that they get a free case of thyroid cancer when they do that, but uh, that was most likely the case. Um, and there are stories from the, from the uh, liquidators of uh, transactions being made, you know, look the other way as the looters go in if they bring in a case of vodka for the, uh, for the reservists. This was a grocery store in uh, one of the towns we were in. Um, the liquidators themselves didn't really care much about littering, you know, it's, uh, the whole place is a disaster, so we found a lot of uh, canisters and gas masks. This was interesting because a lady lives there today. This is well within the exclusion zone. Uh, and as a woman in her early 80s went back. There are what they call self-settlers, people that wanted to go back. They allowed some people to go back. Um, she lives in this little house. As you can see, there's a fairly new fence there. Uh, they take her into Kiev maybe once a month for her to get provisions. Um, we were unlucky that day. Oksana, our tour guide, said once in a while she'll come out and greet tourists and say hello. But she said sometimes she doesn't like her picture taken because even though she's in her early 80s, she's still a woman and she's still vain. And if she doesn't look just right that day, she doesn't want her picture taken. Uh, this is Oksana here. She's explaining uh, as we come into the town of Chernobyl, which is that sign says Chernobyl, what we're about to see. If you'll notice the pipe, it's above ground. Um, after the disaster, any <clears throat> HVAC, any uh, steam, electrical conduit, water, et cetera, was all built above ground because they could not put a spade in the earth because of all the contaminated soil. So everywhere you'll see anything meant to service the towns, it's above ground. There are monuments there. There are sculptures there commemorating what happened. Um, this is an interesting story. Uh, this is a museum uh, dedicated to what happened at Chernobyl. It was built uh, several months after the disaster. You can see the storks on the outside, which symbolize rebirth and birth. Um, and right after it was finished, um, top officials from both Ukraine and Russia went in and inspected it and uh, came out and they locked the doors. They never opened it up again. It's been sitting there for 30 years untouched. Oksana couldn't explain why, but apparently there were things inside they just didn't want people to see. This concrete slab here is full of these um, little pucks. Inside each one is a little light. At night it lights up. They re represent the villages that were destroyed. As you take this walk down here, every one of these is a village or a city that's within the exclusion zone. They have the, the name on one side, and as you walk by on the other side, they're crossed out which to me it looks like a do not enter sign, sort of that European no, which is, I'm not sure, it's a little insensitive way to think about X towns, I don't know. It's a strange memorial though, I thought when walking through there, okay, they're just plain X'd out. It was kind of an odd thing. There was plenty of great propaganda there, uh, a lot of the neo-socialist um, uh, art. Um, this is the kind of art that you saw in the Soviet Union, that you saw in China in the 60s and 70s, and that you see in North Korea today. It's still the same style. It's all over the place. Wonderful stuff, actually. Here's a big surprise um, for me. I didn't know we were going to see this. <coughs> this is an entrance, uh, a big gate, and why these guys decided to have little dolls at the bottom of their gate, I don't know why, but this is the entrance to the Duga Number no. 3 radar array. Um, most of the West didn't know that this existed for many years. This is an array that is about a half a mile long and 450 feet high. It's Moscow's eye on the West. It is meant to detect incoming U.S. missiles. There's another one, was another one just like it in southern Ukraine that kept its eye on China. There was another one in Siberia. Uh, it's almost a half a mile long. It was so big, it was so tall and so big, it was a kind of a misty day that we could not see the top of it. Um, there was, uh, it, was, uh, it was nicknamed the Russian woodpecker because it was a 10 megawatt, it had 10 megawatts of power and it would interrupt shortwave and other radio uh, traffic for thousands of miles. It did that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
and it was, so it was known as the Russian woodpecker. And um, no one could figure out what it was or where it was coming from. Finally, after several years, they, they used the triangulation that they use, and they finally found out where it was. And even as they looked at it um, through satellite photos and photos from the air, they really couldn't figure out what it did because it was unprecedented. I found it endlessly fascinating because to me it was like a giant sculpture. I just couldn't stop taking pictures of it. It was, a, it was, a, it was an incredible, incredible sight. It, as you can see, it was so tall it, would just, it just disappeared into the air. There was speculation that the Soviets were using it for mind control, they were using it for weather control, etc. cetera. Uh, the Soviets listed it on maps as uh, a children's summer camp. <laughs> sort of throw people off the scent. That's about as good as I could get it at showing scale. But you, you know, like most things, you, you just can't tell until you get there. That, there it is from the air. That gives you a, a little bit better idea of the scale. That's a modern picture. Obviously, that's not my picture. Next door is the control center for the, for the array. That was pretty interesting also. Um, to walk around outside, this is where the looters also struck. Um, I'm sure they found plenty of nice copper and other metals. Uh, to take away and sell so that they can have children with birth defects maybe someday. Um, and uh, going inside, which um, was not allowed, but which was really fun and interesting, um, I went all the way to the back and I discovered this great mural, sort of the Soviet uh, space uh, aspiration for, for greatness that they had. more socialist realist art. Um, this one in particular was especially spooky, um, sort of a metaphor for the whole place, I suppose. You may have heard of Chernobyl and the sur surrounding area being uh, one of the world's giant, uh, biggest wildlife refuges, and it, it is. Uh, wildlife actually is thriving there. These are called Savlovsky's horses. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Nine pair were introduced shortly after the disaster to try to grow the wildlife there, and now there's over 100 there. Um, and fox, uh, deer, all sorts of animals are thriving there. It's kind of like the, um, the demilitarized zone uh, between North and South Korea. There's two kilometers on both sides of the border. No men know anything from one side of the country to the other side, and that's become also a great wildlife refuge. A lot of places that we went, Oksana would pull out her dosimeter and uh, warn us that we could only stay there for a few minutes. This is outside a school. Uh, and there she is. She's telling us, um, we must move now. We must, we must keep walking. Um, outside this school, this was a fairly spooky place to visit. You may have seen photographs like this in, in other places. But it was really sad because it's sort of, you know, when you think about kids and the tragedy and everything that, that it went through, um, it, was a, it was just a very odd feeling being in there. Anyone know Russian? We are proud to call ourselves pioneers, is what that says. Very typical. As we went past the school, we soon got to where the plant is. That's not an active construction site. That was a construction site um, in 1986. And after the disaster, um, they just shut it down and they left everything exactly as it was. There's so much metal there that has been so contaminated, they're not even going in there to take it apart. They're not even going to bother to liquidate the area. And just beyond that is the administration buildings for the Chernobyl plant. A little bit beyond that, as we go, you can see the, o un the overground pipes there is reactors number one and two. And now we get to the fourth reactor, the one that blew up with the sarcophagus. And you see on the right, the new sarcophagus. And there it is. I wanted to get this photo as the, uh, with the bus coming out just to give you a scale of how big that thing is. This new sarcophagus cost $2 billion. They're not quite finished with it yet. Um, it was due to be in this year because this is 30 years since the disaster. The sarcophagus has a 30-year serviceable life, so it's expiring this year. Is it ready? No. Uh, Ukraine kept running out of money. 
it cost $2 billion. Um, so they had to scrape their knees with other countries and ask for donations in order to finish this. They think they're going to be able to slide that over sometime in 2017. And there she is whipping out the dosimeter again, saying, we got to go. I couldn't believe, actually, how close they let us get to the number four reactor that blew up, especially with the radiation that's near there. Now, it's really, it's kind of hard to see, but if you see above this fence, you keep going up, you see the little white dots up there along that vertical area? Those are hard hats. Those are the construction guys that are on the site today getting it ready to slide the, sarcophag the new sarcophagus over. They make, uh, the Ukrainians make 11 euro per hour. This is all from Oksana. They make 11 euro per hour. The, the guys from outside Ukraine make way more than that. Now you're thinking 11 euro per hour, by the way, euro now is about a buck 12. 11 euro, that's a terrible wage. In Ukraine, 11 euro an hour is a really good wage. Um, Oksana is a teacher. Her, her wage, uh, the average teacher is 80 to 100 euro per month. The average doctor is slightly higher, maybe 150 euro per month. So 11 euro an hour, that's a good wage. So what's in there? This is a rendering of what's in there today, the wreckage that remains. Uh, there is still 20 tons of nuclear fuel in there, and no one really knows what kind of shape it's in either. Um, there's also uh, 100 kilograms of plutonium. One microgram of plutonium can kill a man, so there's enough plutonium in there to kill 100 million people. Now the math is easy and it's a little glib, but it's still a scary uh, statistic. You know what, it's also the grave, the permanent grave of one Valerie Codeman Chuck, who is the nighttime operator at the plant, the first guy to die there. He is still in there somewhere. That's a little memorial right outside the um, reactor number four. So that was Pripyat before the disaster. Let's go back into Pripyat and see what it looks like today. That's the entrance. That is the, that was the sort of the town hall administration building parking lot in front of it. This was interesting. I asked Oksana, since there's English letters there that say Adam, but there's the Cyrillic all around it. And I said, well, I asked her what that said. And she said, <clears throat> let the Adam do the fighting, not the soldier, which was, which makes sense. But it's, then it's really scary when you think about what happened there. <clears throat> this was the cultural center of the town. Um, we went inside there. By the way, I loved our tour guide because <coughs> in 2013, tourists was, were banned from going into any buildings in Pripyat because one of the schools had collapsed and they were afraid that other buildings would collapse. But we only had six people on our tour and she said, ah, if you keep it to yourself. So Ox Oksana is a code name, by the way. I told her I wouldn't tell anybody. She said, you keep it to yourself, we can go into some buildings. So we were really happy about that. So able to go in this building. It was interesting, trees growing up inside it. That was the movie theater, gymnasium, more gymnasium. This was right outside of there. Um, it's very strange art. I don't know if he was playing badminton or doing bubbles. I don't know. You know, these are some of the iconic images. They're taken by me, but there's a zillion of these taken. You see them on the web and other places of the playground in Pripyat. What's interesting is the playground never opened. They built it, and they were going to open it on May Day. The explosion happened on April 26. So it never opened. The kids not, never got a chance to enjoy it. That was a really spooky place, too. Oksana tested us. She said, what do you think this was? And we're looking at it. We can't. I have no idea what that was. Well, that was a soccer pitch. So that shows you how much na nature has taken over the entire town of Pripyat. And in front of the, the other side of the soccer pitch were the bleachers. I thought that was a little poignant to show the little kids crossing the street where that was never going to happen again. Inside another school in Pripyat. 
different things on the wall. Everything is still there. Nice, uh, it's actually, it's a cool image. Nice stencil of uh, Lenin. The looters were there, obviously. That's Kalinin, another uh, Marxist revolutionary in the Bolshevik days. Cafeteria, and obviously the liquidators were there. I don't know why, but there was one room that was just full of gas masks in the school. I'm not sure why. Pool. Now here was the highlight of the day. Um, at the end of the day, Oksana said, okay, well, we can go to the bus and we can drive back to uh, Kiev and you can get home and get back in time for dinner. Or would you like to go to the top of an apartment and see the city? And we kind of went, uh, yeah, I guess so. And she said, it's 16 stories. I'll go. So we went up to the top of this apartment. Um, and I wish the lights were lower because you're going to lose a lot of the effect of that slide because it was really, really spooky. I'm going to turn the lights down. Oh, I should have done this from the beginning. Oh, it's still not very good. Anyway, so you have to tell, yeah, <laughs> let me start over. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, oh, so um, this was wonderful because it was just spooky. It was, we're 16 stories up and we get this view of all of Pripyat, which is absolutely silent. There's no light, there is no sound, and you see all these empty boxes for about as far as you could see. Absolutely fascinating. It's uh, you know, nothing like it anywhere. It was dusk. It was 4.30 in the afternoon. The sun was already going down. So here's looking south past the apartments and some of the other buildings to what do you think that might be on the horizon there? That would be Chernobyl plant, uh, where they work on it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can just see the shape of the new sarcophagus that they're going to put over there. I did a little bit of telephoto. It just makes it more grainy. But it was, it was probably the highlight of the day because it was just so weird. I've never experienced anything like it. Absolute silence at the top of that building. So as we go down, I went through some of the hallways and some of the apartments and you know see what the looters got and what they didn't. Some mailboxes. As you leave the exclusion zone, uh, as a matter of fact, before we went to lunch in this little building and as we left, you had to go through these machines to make sure that you're not carrying too much contamination out with you. Back to the disaster. Um, that August, uh, there was a uh, commission convened in Vienna to review the disaster in which uh, the Soviets participated fully. Uh, you can see Hans Blix there in the middle there. Um, they were shocked at the testimony <coughs> that were given by the Soviets, uh, especially uh, by, given by this man, uh, Valery Legasov. He was the guy who was the head of the uh, Soviet commission for this. He told the truth. He told everything that he knew. The commission and the Soviets tried to change statistics. They tried to tamp down a lot of the, a lot of the um, really scary numbers, but he was insistent on telling the truth. Two years to the day after the disaster happened, he took his own life. So he was, a lot of people consider him sort of the hero of uh, Chernobyl. He's not the only one. A lot of people who tried to tell the truth, though, they eventually they either just disappeared or they wound up in jail um, during that time. Um, the Soviet Union, it would never recover from this disaster. Um, you could call Chernobyl sort of a monument to uh, the extinction of the Soviet Union. Um, the symbolism is rife. I mean, the, the whole metaphor of decline, et cetera, is very, uh, very prominent with this disaster. Um, Nuclear power for the Soviets was much more than a utility. Uh, it was the symbol of the technical, technological perfection of the Soviet ideal, of the, of the utopia of, of communism. Um, this disaster cost them initially $18 billion. And if you think of what the budget of the Soviet Union was at the time, sorry, uh, rubles and dollars were about it, power then. So $18 billion, which was a sizable chunk of their budget. 
Now, if you include later months and years of reclamation um, and resettlements, moving of the people, et cetera, um, some estimates um, are $200 billion. So when we think about um, the West winning the Cold War, you know, how did, how did we win this Cold War? Well, it's because of you know, Ronald Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall, John Paul II, um, uh, um, Pope John Paul II, right? These were kind of the architects of this. In later interviews with Mikhail Gorbachev, he lists Chernobyl as one of the top reasons for the dissolution of the Soviet Union because of what that cost them, not just in rubles and dollars, but in prestige, and it just shocked the country to the core. Um, I've read the accounts of a lot of the liquidators. It's interesting to hear what they had to say about it. A lot of them were um, veterans of, uh, of the war in Afghanistan. And when they talk about the war of Chernobyl, when they talk about coming home from Afgan Afghanistan, they say, if you came home and you survived your tour of duty, then you survived. When you did the war on Chernobyl, when you came home, you had no idea whether or not you were going to survive. And I thought that was very poignant. There was a lot of guys said that same thing in their re remembrances. Uh, most of the liquidators never did leave, uh, lead a uh, normal life. Uh, most of them have what's called Chernobyl syndrome, which is a whole list of maladies that I don't really want to get into, but uh, they've had tough lives. Um, liquidators in their 50s look like senior citizens today. Um, 20,000 are have estimated to have died. 20% of that number through suicide. Um, and 200,000 are listed as disabled today. <clears throat> I, uh, today, the official number of deaths, 59. Because there are no official government statistics that say exactly what these things are. They just have never published this. So they rely on statistics from World Health Organization and other people for that. Ironically, out of this, and out of Mikhail Gorbachev's anger came Glasnost. He was so mad that he was not informed of the details of the disaster and the gravity of the disaster during the first several days and weeks. <clears throat> and then once Legasov started spewing what the real numbers were at the, uh, at the commission, he decided we've got to open up. And as you know, Glasnost means openness, et cetera. So the twin pillars of Gorbachev's sort of revolution Revolution maybe being the wrong word in the context of <laughs> uh, Russian history, but his big, big change, um, perestroika on one side and glasnost on the other. Um, glasnost came, pretty much started from Chernobyl. So despite the, uh, the contamination of the site, uh, Chernobyl, the one and two reactors, continued to operate for 14 more years. They shut down the last one in the year 2000. <coughs> Today, 8 million people live in the uh, contaminated areas of Belarus and Ukraine, and they continue to eat food from contaminated farmland. 1,200 people were allowed to move back. There's probably 600 uh, left. Um, these are called the resettlers. Um, today, 4,000 people live in Chernobyl town, and they're there dedicated to keeping the place safe and keeping the place secure and putting that new sarcophagus on. Um, Contrast that with the old Pripyat, there are no kids there. Uh, there are no schools, um, but there is. The last remaining statue of Lenin in all of Ukraine is in Chernobyl town. Over 400 villages and settlements were wiped off the map, either raised or buried. Uh, and in 2011, Ukraine opened up the exclusion zone to odd people like myself um, for tourism to see, what, uh, see firsthand what the after effects were. I'm going to leave you, as far as Chernobyl, with one quote. There's a guy named Georgi Kopachinsky, who was director of the Soviet Central Committee on Nuclear Energy. He said this, we knew this. Three years earlier, we'd sent out a, uh, a warning to all plants with reactors with these absorbers, warning of this problem, but no actions had been taken. This was our arrogance at the time. We believed we were the masters of the atomic reactions. It was a horrible mistake. So what it looks like today, you've got Pripyat up on the left, which is pretty much <coughs> taken over by nature. And then directly down from that, you can see this white area here. That's the plant, that's the sarcophagus. So you can see how close they were, but that's, that's what it looks like today. 
So how does that compare? How does that compare with Three Mile Island and uh, Fukushima? It doesn't. It, there's really no comparison between those disasters. I'll be quiet for a minute. I'm not going to read this slide to you. You can read the slide. It's pretty interesting. When I read up on the Fukushima one, I, 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 like I think most people, thought that a lot of people died from radiation poisoning and from the plant blowing up, and, and, it, uh, and, and they didn't. Now, it depends on what you read. It depends on, it gets political when you talk about this. Uh, a lot of people believe that there will be no deaths from radi uh, radiation. The, the cloud went out, it dissipated, everything is safe. One estimate that is uh, a pretty, by a pretty well-respected organization says they think that there will be between 300 and 600 cancer deaths in the future. Um, and then if you read from other activists, they say, you know, it's a disaster yet to come. Um, uh, I, I can't pick a side. I, I don't know what to think, but I, I was kind of shocked at, um, at the stats that I did read on that. And Three Mile Island, that, I mean, that was a pretty scary thing, but epidemiological studies still they have not found a single cancer case that they can trace directly to Three Mile Island. I'm sure you'll read other things that say something different, but um, that's a comparison. Now I'd like to open up to any questions and answers. If it's about physics, I'm not going to answer it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just kind of stationary in the soil. Yeah, for, for, from what I know, they buried it. And they buried it pretty deep. And a lot of places where they, they had very radioactive buildings and furniture and clothes, et cetera, they buried it and they, then they covered it with concrete. So to the extent it does get into the water table and then eventually comes back out, I, I, you know, I, I can't answer that. I don't do know. Have any monitoring? Oh, I think they do. Yeah, I, I think they do, but I don't know what the statistics like are for what. Those maps, you know, afterwards where all those clouds were. Right. Is there, is there anything like that currently that they can see or tell if there's anything up in the atmosphere? That I don't know. I, my guess is probably. Yeah. Yes, Al. You mentioned farming. Mm hmm. Doing farming. Are they, they yeah. monitoring or what? Is you know, I, that's a great question. I. And no one could answer that really well for me as I asked, because that, that woman's house that you saw, she grows stuff there. And there's people that live in, in the town of Chernobyl and other little towns, these resettlers, they grow food and they eat food. And as we know today, lots of acres of farmland outside the exclusionary zone were contaminated as well. Um, since there's no official, I, I'm sure some people are monitoring this, but as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I haven't read anything that's published on what happens to that food. While we were there, one, and one of my pictures had a bunch of apples that had dropped from a tree. And all I could think of was I would eat that apple and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get cancer. I mean, just, I, so I don't know. You know, sometimes when people move back to places like that, they just, that's their home. And if they die there because of that, that's, that's okay with them. Mm -hmm. with, uh, dairy and milk. Right. Yeah, the whole Love Canal thing and other stuff like that, yeah. Yep. Yes? Uh, if there had been a containment vessel in the first place, would it have made any difference? You mean with the explosion? With the explosion? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. I, 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 don't, I don't know that it could have operated with a containment vessel over it. I, I don't know. But I doubt it. Yes, Jamie. Uh, when did they open up temperature doors? Uh, in 2011 is when they opened up the exclusion zone for tours. Yes, sir. Check on your last slide, you had that IEA scale. What's the range of that, 0 to 10? 
Ten, zero to 20. Oh, I, I th five, seven, seven? yeah, I th seven. Seven's the highest. Seven's, seven's the worst. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Bill. With the kind of grief they took for Chernobyl, I imagine they did. That, you know, it's, it, it, up until they opened up again, it was a pretty closed society, so I, I can't answer that with any sort of uh, accuracy. I, I don't know, but you'd think that they would. Because uh, the whole physics, nuclear physics community knew of the flaws. Well, they knew of the flaws themselves. As a matter of fact, three years before, in Lithuania, in a Soviet reactor, they had an accident similar. It was not nearly as dramatic, but three years earlier in Lithuania they had the same thing happen. They said, well, probably should change some things and we see what happened. Yeah, I was shocked to read that too. <laughs> Mark? So the, the tours, are yeah. they, you know, advertised and promoted like a tour of Gettysburg or? And, and Chernobyl tours, ChernobylTours.com. That's, I, you know, I just, it was, I thought, I wonder if you can go through that place. I Googled Chernobyl Tours, went right to the website. <gasps> oh, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's great. It's really great. Yes. About the children. Mm -hmm. Forget how many children were there? 5,000, you said? Well, there was, the population was 45,000. And there was a lot of kids. There were five schools and 15 kindergartens. Any so. Yeah, well, I'm sure World Health Organization probably has follow-up studies of what happened to those kids. Um, and I, you know, I kind of included that in my macro view of uh, 20,000 people eventually died, 20% uh, of those via suicide, um, and 200,000 disabled. Yeah. Um, but there's no official statistics on it. Like, Ukraine has not said, okay, here's what happened. We followed these kids. To no, nothing like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. which I'm hoping to visit next month. Mm. And I had read, well, first of all, I had read John Hirsch's mm -hmm. report, and then I yeah. read something else that talked about people staying liquefying. Right. And I, I couldn't finish that. Yeah. But then I decided to check the Atomic Energy Commission. Mm -hmm. And I was frank, I mean, I would think that that would be really a to the site, but mm -hmm. I was shocked at what seemed to me to be a really minimal amount of human yeah. Yeah, the IAEA came under some fire after Chernobyl because, as I said, when Legasov was giving off his statistics, um, they were complicit in trying to, trying to hide some of the, uh, the disastrous results. And um, I, I haven't gone to their site. I've never read any of the stuff they do. But yeah, I, that's not a surprise. That Hershey book is, that's a pretty gruesome book. I, I, I read that as well. And the, the, the skin melting off right to the bone, that's, that's, that's Chernobyl syndrome all over. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen the, some of the pictures. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. Judy. So when you left and you went through those um, yeah. radiation meters, mm, yeah. how much were you around? And how, how comfortable were you feeling that those were reliable? Oh, you mean the machines themselves? Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was for show. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I was comfortable with the you amount of... Cyber check, right? Uh, no. Um, uh, it, yeah, I, you know, I thought about that before I went. I think there's, although liability in Eastern Europe is not quite the same as liability in the United States of America, I would think that it's a fairly popular thing to do now. I, you know, I just kind of, I, 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 I think it's okay. Oksana was pretty good. She had the dose of meter. She said, okay, we got to go. And the other thing that gave me ease was, there, she's a, she seemed like a smart with a person. She's a teacher, and she does these things every weekend. You know, she makes ten times what she does teaching school, doing that. But so I, I'm not, I'm not that bothered by it. You, as a matter of fact, you get, you get you know, X-rays and different things. Flying in a plane, you get radiation. So anyway, Hal. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. It, it's exactly right. I'm, I'm, thanks for bringing that up. It's. And I fly a lot in planes, and you know it's 15 hours LA to Sydney, and I've done that seven times. So 
I'll probably, I, I was exposed to a lot more than, than walking through the exclusion zone. All right. Okay. The sarcophagus. Yeah. 30 years, what's going on? Trying to build a new one? Oh, yeah. The, um, that, that one is. That's what they are building. Well, that's what that gigantic uh, thing is that you saw right. That giant, really shiny one, it's nice and new. They, they polish that thing every single day. They like to make that thing really look really good because they spent $2 billion on it, so they, it better shine nicely. Uh, there it is, right there. That's going to be on rails. They're going to they're going to push that bad boy right over the other one, and then seal it. Now that one is for, oh, I, I can't remember. That one is for several hundred years. That's what they think it will be. Quick. Just, there was four reactors there, right? Yes. The one blew up on a test. It didn't even get going, right? No, no, it was fully operational. Oh. But they wanted to save energy. They were going to do a uh, a, a test on it. So. Right. Then the other ones. They shut them down, or they, were they still running? And, and then, because you, you said they just closed the last one down. Yeah. So yeah. Did they shut the other ones down and start them up in some time uh, future? Uh, my, uh, my guess is they would have shut them down during those those seven months that they were doing and the Battle of Chernobyl. Back up and Flick that switch, it goes on. No, I, I suppose, yeah. And yeah, because it. When did the people move back in, the resettlers? The resettlers moved in, I think, uh, over a year later, they started letting people back in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much. Great.